seen the slides, so he's trying to determine what a large movie site is. Uh, but still, it's something that covers the best practices when you're trying to work on a WordPress project. No matter how large exactly it is, but the larger the project gets, the more important it is to actually cover the best practices. You know? So, two words about me. I'm the WordPress ambassador at SiteGround. Um, we are kind of outside of the hole, so come and ask us any questions if you have. I'm also WordPress architect at Devrix, which is a small agency for WordPress development. I used to code different things, including Java and Python and plain PHP and other frameworks. I'm a WordPress community contributor, which means that I contribute to different aspects of WordPress, including the core, team reviews, and other things. I then really like no peer link with underscores between each word, which is really hard to type on the phone because you need to pick a few buttons. And I'm also an open source addict and a coffee server. So they do more for my local coffee shop. And we're not in Amsterdam, so not that type of coffee shop. No? <laughs> so, uh, speaking of watch projects and setup, there's one thing that I can't actually skip, and it's a tweet from WordCamp San Francisco last year, which says, Did you see Mark Jacobs speak yesterday? We had a Don Draper of WordPress on stage. So, if you've seen Mark Jacobs, you definitely know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, I'll definitely advise you to just Check them out on WordPress.tv because most of the, you know, really incredible WordPress talks based on watch projects and deployment and everything like that. Uh, he's given those three days of WordCamps already. So definitely check it out. Anyway, so speaking of watch projects, we need to really define how to set a watch project and what sort of different options do we have for this. The first thing is the service. And one of the most popular combinations is the lab stack, which includes the Linux, Flash, MySQL, and PHP. It's fairly popular. Most hosting providers do have that sort of setup. You probably run your website on that sort of setup, and that's pretty much fine. There are different ways to optimize it. There are different things that work very well on that sort of setup, and that's one of the possible things that you can do. One of the best things that you can do on that setup is generally use Varnish too. Varnish is a caching engine that also works like a reverse proxy, depending on what exactly you want to use. And if you put it on the top of WordPress, you can, uh, on the top of Bash, you can use it to cache different layers of your website. Maybe the static cache, maybe the dynamic data if you configure it properly. Uh, so it's a very good combination if you manage to put both, uh, both stacks on the top of each other. So this is something that you might want to consider if you have a site that's uh, for example, not really um, heavily inspired by post queries and dynamic data for walking users, it's generally the way to go. Right? If you handle hundreds of thousands of users just taking get requests to your website, it's really lean, just provides static data, it doesn't really reach your server at all. It's just on the top of everything, it says, okay, I got this request a bit early, I know exactly what I need to return, I'm not even going to bother the server with it which makes it pretty special. Another possible combination is the LAMP stack, which is Linux, Nginx, PHP, and MySQL. It's a popular thing, you know that you've read about it, you know that it's like super cool to run it, that Nginx does miracles and stuff like that. And Nginx is really awesome in some use cases. Uh, it can do some things better also. In addition to a flash, it's not only a web server, but it's again a reverse proxy, it has a caching engine. It has different modules that you can make it uh, run even faster, and it has a more, uh, more advanced syntax to generally define your server configuration, which makes it pretty, pretty smooth. And what it says is that you can use, since it's also reverse proxy education, you can, I've even seen people using it on the top of Apache instead of Varnish, or even people really reversing these three technologies on the top of each other, depending on what's suitable for the project. But still, it's one of the popular combinations. You might want to check it out. You might want to test your own project with it and see which works uh, best. Now, for the varnish, uh, the only 
I think that I outlined as a drawback really is the lack of SSL support. It just doesn't support SSL. The official website says, look, we are not going to support SSL. It's slow, it's clumsy, it's, it's definitely something that we don't really want to add into that product. So not only they don't support it now, but the official the official author actually said that they're probably never going to support that. Uh, Alright, so the new kit on the board is HHDM. How many of you have heard about HHDM? Okay, just a few. So this is the virtual machine from Facebook. And yeah, I know most people when they heard Facebook they said, nah, we're not going to use that one. <laughs> but then again, these guys have more than a billion uh, users on their website, which runs PHP, sort of, sort of PHP. But still, they still say it's PHP. So it's the it's really a great virtual machine that uh, compiles the PHP code to some sort of machine code per se, and it's revolutionary in the way of execution of the queries. Because you know one of the one of the drawbacks of all languages. Well, I'm not going to say all, but languages, for example, for desktop systems and for server stuff like C or C++, is that there are two part time languages. Every single small change requires compilation so that you get a binary code. So this thing requires a lot of time to compile for larger projects, but you don't have to interpret it for every single request. It's already compiled and it's already there. It's something that uh, systems and platforms like Java and .NET try to accomplish too, because for Java you have the bytecode, when Java compiles the bytecode, for .NET you have the intermediate language when it does pretty much the same. Uh, so that's what Facebook tried to accomplish with HHDM and different benchmarks and tests says that you might get up to like 10 times faster environment. Really, you can run any sort of test for any environment to make it run faster or slower than the other one, but still you might try it out and it runs pretty well. Uh, the other versions of HHBM, they have their own bundled server that you can use, but nowadays you can actually connect it to Apache or Nginx, and you can just replace uh, PHP or PHP FPM and just say, okay, I want this to run through uh, hard to, sorry, to HHVM and it's going to compile it and run all the PHP code the way that HHVM is going to use. So, uh, when we pick our version environment for the setups, we want to know that we need to version control all the things. And why is that important? Because no matter what sort of project do you have, is it a small project or a large project, you always need to have version control. And I've heard this story that we're like, okay, but like I'm the only person working on that project and it doesn't really matter because I'm going to work it at home and I'm going to deliver it in a few days. And every now and then, when you work like this, you say, okay, apparently my latest decision wasn't right. But I've been working on this for like the past six hours, for like three days. So why do we need to do this? And then we try, we need to revert all of this to the point where it was working. But we, since we don't have version control, we actually have no idea where it's working exactly now. So we need to use version control, of course. Uh, we have different options for this. The most uh, popular one in the WordPress work is Subversion. Because of the fact that the WordPress org repository runs Subversion by default, which means the WordPress core, which means the WordPress plugins, the WordPress themes, and everything like that. So most people are used to it. I definitely advise for Git development. There are various reasons to advise for that, for example, the branch management, but my most uh, favorite reason is generally exactly the local development. Even if you work standalone, if you have Git installed in your machine, you only need to type git in it, enter, and you generally have a working git repository in your system. You don't have to host it on some remote server somewhere, you don't have to fetch it, you don't have to have remote connectivity, you can, you can work offline with Git on your local environment and keep track of your changes, which is really revolutionary. The next thing that, if you work with Git, of course, you might want to know is the submodules. Submodules is a feature of Git that allows you to actually get different Git repositories and attach them to your main Git repository. Why would you do that? Well, for example, if you have standalone projects that you have been working on, or actually other people have been working on, and you want to bundle them in your project environment, right? Imagine some library, like right? a Facebook SDK, or even jQuery, if you want to use it, you know, the full stack, with all the root scripts and everything. You have other companies and other teams working on this, 
and you want to bundle them and actually work in your problem. So with submodules you can connect them and you can update all submodules independently. It's some sort of dependency management for your own project in a way that you don't get a specific version of the project and work on it and then copy and paste and merge and everything. You just get a specific version and then update it from the root repository and always be able to get the latest version. Also, if you work on your own system, you can just decouple some components like some specific framework or some plugin that's used in other repositories and you can say, okay, I want to use this version and you can also pick a specific branch of this version that you're going to use for that plugin or extension. Well, you can run your own Git server or SDN server or Mercurial server but it's really helpful if you get connected to one of the social coding environments like GitHub or GitHub. Why is that? Well, GitHub for one has a whole two set of working for developers. Like, you have the version control parent. You have nice divs of the commits so that you can check the divs, you can check what's added, what's deleted, who did it. You have buttons for most features like git blame, you can see who did what, when was it done. You have a list of the commits, you can browse through that. You have some nice graphs to see who committed what and when, how many commits are there have been committed and everything like that, which is pretty helpful. You also have the issues, which is something that you might want to use as a bug tracking system or project management system. And also there's one other handy thing that's called pull requests, which isn't GitHub specific, it's like something that you can do with Git. But GitHub allows you to generally fork a repository, which means get this repository, clone it in my own profile, and I'm going to work on it. And when you work on your repository and produce a patch, some fixed version, you can send it back to the original developer and say, look, I did these changes and I saw this bug that was existing in your project account. And the entire UI is very friendly, it's made in a way that the real developer, the real one, okay, the original developer, uh, is really able to see, okay, I got this two request, this guy allows me to, you know, just add these five lines of code and remove these two lines of code. So I can generally say, merge pull request, click, and we have our own change in the original repository. You know, it's almost like Twitter. If you want to contact a large company and you can write down on their Facebook wall, they're going to delete your post. But if you write them on Twitter, they're not going to delete your message and all of your friends are going to see that. So it's generally similar with GitHub pull requests, you know? You just issue a pull request, they see everything, your friends see everything, you have the change in your own repository already, and the only thing they want to do, that they have to do is just merge it. So, if we have our server environment and we have version control in place, we might also want to think about testing, especially for wider projects. And as our Google developer says, I don't always test my code, but when I do, I do it in production. Why? It's not my code, you know? So, it's really not the best practice to do that. Testing in production is a YOLO style, and you don't want to do it really in production projects. But then again, in, in the WordPress environment, not only WordPress, but most PHP projects, there are different versions of testing that you can apply to your project. PHP Unit is probably the most popular one. It's a unit testing framework that you can embed in your project, and you can get different chunks of your code, different functions, different components. You can stub them, and you can test the input and output of those functions. For, a, for example, if you have a small, a simple function that's calculating, I don't know, rectangular area. What does this function have? It has uh, two variables for width and height, and then you need to calculate the area, right? So you expect to pass two numbers and get a third number. You can use PHP unit to just call this function, pass several different variations of inputs, and assess the output at the end. That's pretty much all you have to do. Uh, of course, your code needs to be testable, and you might want to do it in a way that Actually, every single line of code is testable one way or the other. Like there are different concepts like test-driven development that actually produce tests before the actual code has been run. Why? Because if you think about it, that's that sort of style and that approach means the following. If you try to build an architecture of WordPress for some project, you're going to code and write some code and refactor and do some changes and at the end it's going to turn out, oh wait, I missed that function. And actually, I didn't want to connect these like that. And that's not the best way that I could build that. But if you do test-driven development, 
you write your tests before you have your code. So you say, for example, for e-commerce, you're going to say, I expect to have an order and get products for this order. You know? So you already have the API. It means that you need to have an order class, you need to have a product class, you need to have an array of uh, products for the orders, and that sort of stuff. So you can build your architecture based on your tests, based on the test uh, driven development, and also you always have your tests running. And until your tests pass, your project is not actually uh, active. Another thing that you can use is QUnit. It's a JavaScript unit testing framework because if you think about it, a significant part of WordPress is now not PHP, but it's actually JavaScript. Let's take an example of the media library, the customizer, uh, the entire tiny MC editor in the post screen, and many more are actually using JavaScript. They're almost entirely JavaScript built. So if you want to do a complete testing suit, you should have unit testing for JavaScript too. And QUnit is one of the testing frameworks that you can incorporate for that sort of unit testing. Now, a bit more interesting and still that probably most of you haven't seen is, for example, Behat. Behat is a PHP framework for business expectations. It's a behavioral driven development testing where you can generally write specifications, write requirements, and turn those requirements into code. One of the reasons I love Behat is that the tests, the way that the tests are written, is almost like having a specification from a project manager. For example, you probably don't see on that screenshot, but the example given here is a feature. Your first feature and the scenario is successfully describing scenario, given we have something, when I do something, then I should see something. And why is that? We have given a button has been clicked, when I move the screen on the right or something, then I get this result as some result. Why is that good? Because every single sentence is actually a function that you can create. And you can create a function in your code. And when the project manager is reading the requirements, you have uh, an exactly matching code that reflects this requirement, which is pretty solid, especially for business people that don't deal with code. They just write your business requirements and you write a code uh, underlying those business requirements. Ming is an extension to Behat, so to speak, which is doing web acceptance there. For example, if you have a project that isn't suitable for unit testing, like your code doesn't expect an input, doesn't pass a very valuable output, or something like that, but you have some specific results that are output to the browser, you can use Mink for that. For example, you have an HR website, and you want to have some filters, and filtering the search, the search database, you get some specific results sorted in some way. Using Mink, you can actually create tests that validate your HTML. You can also do headless tests so that you don't have to run a browser or you can do a browser and you can click some uh, filters, you can change the input and then it's going to reflect the output and you're just going to validate the HTML. It's pretty nice because think about it, you have a test database with 100 job offers in your HR website, you have two filters and you say, when I hit the filter, for example, more than 80,000 here, then I expect to see six HTML divs with these results. And that's our validation. If we break our code, this test database is no longer going to return the results that we are expecting. Hence, we have to fix our code. It's pretty brilliant. Selenium is one of the other products that I really enjoy because it's, it's not an API for automated browser testing, but it has a really decent you know, backend infrastructure so that you can write your own code in several different languages. So they, they have their Selenese language, uh, but you also have an API for PHP, Python, Java, and other languages where you can uh, write your code. Also, Selenium allows you to build automated UI testing by clicking. The most simple operations, you can just start, uh, there is a Firefox extension, for example, you can just start a Firefox extension, click hit, and then you browse to your website. For example, if you're reviewing WordPress themes, something that I've done, uh, like a few years ago, I was running Selenium, and I say, okay, I have a WordPress website with test data, you know? I have like 30 pages and 20 blog posts and everything. So, I'm running through a scenario when I'm just clicking links. I'm just navigating from one link to another, scrolling down, clicking another link, scrolling down, and everything. Now, recording this macro, 
recording that, I can just switch the theme and run this macro again. And it's going to run and click all the pages and I'm going to see the results in a different user interface environment. See? I don't have to click anymore, I just need to hit play and it's going to load all the pages, scroll down to the bottom and everything. It's really a lazy job. And developers are by default lazy. <laughs> so, um, having the testing in place, we might want to think about the toolkit as well. How many of you have used WPCLI? Now, the rest of you, your first job after the work camp is go to the after party, of course. The first thing after the work camp after party is go and install WPCLI. You know? It's an, a set of command line tools that allows you to do uh, your automated engine to build everything around the WordPress section. So, you, can, you, you have an API running from the shell that you can up post. You can get users, get plugins, activate teams and plugins, list all available plugins, update them, everything through a single line of code. Uh, moreover, since all these things you can do through the WordPress admin, how about adding a specific role or a capability, right? Without a plugin, you don't have any options to do that with WordPress. And without PCLI, you can do, I don't know, that would be role, add, some role. That would be cap, add, some cap to some role, you know? And you can extend your overall user experience and your um, generally your workflow can be extended with WPCLI. You can automate scripts, you can create migration scripts, you can do a lot of testing. For example, you build your project and you, you just want to see if, some given, if a given post is there by ID. You can go through the admin. You can search through tens of thousands of posts. You can go to buy an OPS admin or whatever crazy tool you're using for data things. But it's so much easier, especially on a remote environment, just SSH and, and do that will be post get some ID and see if the, that post exists or not. Another thing is running Vagrant. You know, Vagrant is a way to, to create a virtual machine that replicates your server environment. Now, I know that most people that have seen Vagrant and haven't used it, they say, well, why would I need that, right? But Vagrant is actually a way to really replicate a specific server environment for a given project and set it up locally easily without eating too much of your resources and making it really easy to replicate that environment. And why is it needed? For example, you're running a, I don't know, some MacBook Air with the latest MacOS version, whatever it is, I don't really understand of the Bit and Apple thing. Uh, or you're using Windows or anything like that. But your server environment is some CentOS or Ubuntu or I don't know, Debian or anything like that. And you have different Operating system, different PHP versions, different MySQL versions, different varnish and whatsoever version that you have. So your environment is so much different than the original environment where the product is going to run on that you're likely going to get stuck with different issues. Especially PHP incompatibility stuff, deprecated functions, um, some things that used to work one way but don't work like that. PHP is quite good with that. You know, we used to support that and we're going to deprecate that, but in two versions later we're going to support part of it. So unless you have the very same version of the stack, it's going to be really hard for you to replicate that. And Vagrant is normally uh, something that works for, you know, it's just a bare skeleton of a virtual machine, but what you can do extra, ooh, I opened the website by mistake. Awesome. Get back to my slides. That's the benefit of running slides based on WordPress because you can generally go to a website directly through your browser. So the next thing that you can run is uh, varying vagrant vagrants. I think that's like this. If Jake is somewhere here, he can say it was the best way to pronounce it. I don't really know. But VVV is something that you can run to actually set an entire working WordPress environment. And this WordPress environment is going to have, of course, work, uh, working WordPress, the latest uh, WordPress version from Trump. WordPress for BuddyPress, some testing environment with the unit tests, and pretty much everything for you to work with WordPress. And like I said, that sort of virtual machine, the, at least the background setup, is, is so cool that it doesn't really run on X. It doesn't run on a desktop environment, which makes it in like 150 megabytes from. You can set it up, it's going to set up all domain name, resolution for you, and everything. And you're going to start one background instance, work on a project, shut it down open another instance with a different tool set based on your server environment, work on it, close it, and that's pretty much it. You don't even have to work, you don't even have to have 
uh, apart my store page from your own environment if you have data. Regarding deployment, there are also different strategies, and FTP is not one of those strategies. So one does not simply use FTP for live, for live sites, you know, you, you don't really have to do it, especially on insecure Wi Fi. Actually, go to the airport and open your FTP cloud and log into your, all of your websites. It's the best way to, you know, to your business. It's better than business. Uh, but yeah, then again, uploading stuff with FTP is on the way to your what I personally like is Capistrano. Capistrano is a remote server automation deployment tool. Uh, by using Capistrano, you can really automate your process, connect your virtual control environment, you can pull everything that you, that you actually need, you can specify specific branch, specific server, and just push all those changes to your production server. It's really neat in a way that uh, if you have virtual control, and you should have virtual control, you just commit, run the Capistrano build script, it's pulling every key on your server, creating a new folder, and linking the new document root uh, for that domain to your folder. Now, what I like in Capistrano, and I'm going to give an example to FTP because I know that some of you use it, is what happens with FTP? You need to upload a point, a new version of the point. The site needs to work. You're a production specialist, so you generally upload the new version of the point and re uh, replace the old version of the point. Now, in the overriding process, the site would be, well, I'm not going to say down, but it would be broken to some extent because you're going to have some files that are currently overridden, you're going to have some files from the old version and the new version, and some stuff is just not going to work. The larger the plugin or extension or team you're overriding, the bigger the time slot where your site isn't working properly. And at the same time, when something is down, like you break something with your day, you have no reasonable way to actually get back to the previous version. Now, with Capistrano, you have, uh, you have a folder, you have the current link, which is the current version of uh, your project, and you have the releases folder. And every single deploy goes to the releases folder with a unique ID, and you just move the same link for the current folder to the new release. It takes several milliseconds, and if something is broken and you uh, roll back, it takes several milliseconds to just point the version to the other release. You know? Your site isn't broken for several minutes, you don't have to then delete everything and start from scratch if your deploy is broken, and it's uh, much easier. Now, Mark Jacob, uh, whom I mentioned a bit earlier, he has the WP Stack, which is a project which uh, generally has a toolkit for creating WordPress websites with um, Capistrano as well. So you can check it out, it has um, some flow that makes it easier for you to deploy those websites on a WordPress website, uh, on uh, your new server, sorry. Um, two of the other popular tools that DevOps folks use are Chef and Puppet. You probably, you've probably seen some of those scripts, for example, background use Puppet scripts, to automate the, the virtual machine creation and everything. But if you're a fan of any of those tools or your environment supports them, it's also a way to actually use one of them to set up your own environment. Whether it be deployment or you want to, for example, create new instances or duplicate your environment and can, uh, create test version, staging version and everything like that. You can also check out uh, Chef, Puppet, there are other tools like Ansible which is a Python driven tool, and much more than you, uh, even more if Capistrano isn't sufficient for you. When it comes to maintenance, you might want to use Dependence Manager for PHP, like Composer. And Composer is a great way to connect your current project with all of the currently developed PHP libraries that are hosted in the Composer repository. Uh, so it's pretty much the same like in some modules. You connect several different PHP uh, repositories, you add them to your project, you don't, again, download them and update them manually, you just say, point to this specific version of this library. And whenever you want, you say, just update the version of this library. Then, everyone who has Composer and downloads your project, they just need to, to do Composer update, and it's going to update from the Composer repository the latest versions of that given library. Grunt is another thing that you can automate your process with. It's a JavaScript task runner. It's used in the WordPress uh, core too. 
It's something that you might use for, for example, minifying your CSS in JavaScript, uh, for moving some folders here and there, for example, uh, you might automate it to move your WP config outside of your project, or create a WP config vocal file that it's used for your local environment, or anything like that. You, there are lots of tasks built for Grunt, and you can even use uh, preprocessors and like take the SAS files and compile them to CSS. So, Really, a lot of things are already built with Grunt, and it's uh, it's really easy to use it and add it to your project. The next step is uh, doing some continuous integration. What's continuous integration? Well, it's one of the best practices for the lean startup technologies. It's something that Ken Beck and folks uh, have discovered a long time ago uh, together with Eric Young. So, uh, it's a way to to prevent all of those practices for, okay, let's work three months and deploy and see how much broken things do we have, and then punch them for two weeks, sleeping day and night, and whole week in the office. You know, it's something that probably most of you have already suffered from, and it's not really the best thing to do. So, continuous integration as a practice is something that allows you to generally deploy every single commit to your production website, and have an easy way to actually revert it, uh, and it adds up to all the best practices that we have mentioned. We need version control, we need deployment that allows us to revert, we need unit tests, we, we need behavioral driven tests, and having the entire suit allows us to just say, okay, we'll commit now, we'll commit in three hours, in six hours, and every single time we deploy the new version on the server. Before deployment, we're going to run the tests, we will see if there are any regressions. If not, we're just going to, to commit and deploy to the live website. The benefit from that is that if we find an error, we just know that we have to go back to the previous version. It's not like working for three months of an entire team, breaking so many things, and then reverting and trying to apply only part of those things. There's less pressure, less tension, and everything. Also, with some continuous integration servers such as Travis, you can create several different environments running different stacks. For example, you might have a patch with PHP 5.3 with some ice coverage. You can have Nginx with PHP 5, 6 and some other version. So you can create several environments and you can deploy to all of them. You do a test deploy. Deploy to all of them, run your uh, unit tests, run your BDD tests, everything that you got, and you see if your version is compatible with all the environments. If any of those is broken, you're going to get reported. Look, at this instance, those unit tests are broken. Those BDD tests are broken and everything like that. So, you patch everything, you fix everything, when your tests pass, you just deploy to the website, and it's not likely that it's going to be broken, especially if your test environment looks like your prediction environment. Now, um, there's one tool that's called Chaos Monkey. I think it was uh, invented by Netflix. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like Netflix are using um, Amazon, and they have some huge instances that are running for different things, and they have a Chaos Monkey that's something that's running in production and the chaos monkey is doing the following thing it's just killing instances it's killing networking tunnels it's killing different parts of the network no? so it, it simulates an environment where there's something going on with the server because you know how bad it is when your server is down you know how bad it is when your backup is off uh, when there's no network connectivity you have dns issues and everything like that so in order to make netflix a service that's more stable the Chaos Monkey runs during business hours and it just makes the life of the developers harder because it's trying to break their environment. So in order for the development and the DevOps team to, to make the product stable and something that runs, they, they need to do it so flexible, they need to uh, get rid of the uh, one-man army scenario when everything relies on a single point of failure and they need to make it in a way that if an instance is down, it's going to run for another instance. If the network here is down, it's going to pass to another wall bouncer and it's going to pass to another bunch of servers. So that's another tricky strategy that I really like, as simulating failures in your network and in your entire engine. And by these failures, you're making your product more stable and more flexible and more uh, prone to, not prone to that, that sort of errors. So, uh, speaking about different platform stacks and monitors, we might want to monitor and take care of different environments, for example, the front-end application. You might want to implement all the unit tests there. 
uh, automated testings, there are even some tools that create pixel perfect check of your PSD and your product and like automating there are some pixel differences. The middle tier applications, the subsystems, for example the ESPLs, you might create a test database, especially when you run your unit test, verify your data against that uh, test base, create new instances, delete them, the operating system, the hardware and the network uh, level as well. So, uh, our mindset in essence should be the following. We shouldn't be striving to do the things the very hard way, you know? We say, okay, that's hard, I don't need virtual draw, I don't need unit testing, I don't need like that. My project is small or it's really hard, it's wasting time and such. Well, it does at first, but when you get used to it, you really can get rid of it because you just need to practice. You need to take the, the stairs one step at a time. Like, at first we're always, I won't do it, like, it doesn't make sense. And then it's like, okay, I maybe I'm going to do it, but I can do it. Then I want to do it. How do I do it? I'll try to do it. I can do it. I'll do it. Yay, I did it. You know? That's the mindset that we need to follow. Like, everything is hard at first. Like, no one likes to learn a new language, no one likes to learn a new platform, a new server, a new engine. But more often than not, it's useful. It's useful for you to know how it works, uh, when is it applicable to use it, what's the best product to use in a given scenario, and everything. Also, don't forget taking care of caching for larger projects. There are different ways to do caching, like uh, you might check the out cache that's uh, bundled in PHP, in the latest PHP. You might check different engines for static caching, dynamic caching, direct object caching, HTML caching, and such. Uh, also, do do implement logging. If you add logging, you might check different scenarios from your project and see where something fails, if we have execution for something, is an order processed or not, is a product added to a cart or not, and everything like that. It will be much easier to get edge cases if you have logging integrated. And debugging. You need to have, you know, of course, clean code and you need to have the best practices in order to debug everything. Whether it's the PHP, the JavaScript, some other code, even SPL code. Everything that you need in your own project. So, a cheat sheet for our testing environment. It's like we need the LAMP stack, you might be now a pass, change in H, you might want to run uh, HHVM on it. You need virtual control, you need to have uh, different testing processes integrated in your environment. You need the toolkit, the toolkit set in the best possible manner, deployment practices and scripts like Capistrano, Chef, Share, um, Puppet. You need to take care of the maintenance of your sites and, of course, take care of the metering as well. Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take a break. Any questions? Back to us. I can always talk Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that there were pre-made grunt uh, recipes yeah. out there. Is there like a repo of those? Or yeah, there is, uh, but I'm not quite sure if I'm going to run tasks repository or something. I, I know that I follow a few websites for this, but it's like Run.js components. That's probably the best list. You have like 3,000 and you know, 3,400 uh, entries here. You have different contributions. You see compile less to CSS, start a connect web server, minify images, uh, parse CSS and something, uh, compile SAS to CSS with compass, minify HTML, minify SVG. And really you have a lot of things like optimize with WarJS, um, there are lots of things that you can optimize with Run. Anything else? Which one? Yeah, the slides are available at talks.dev.p.tu slash large WordPress setup. It's generally a WordPress plugin, uh, the HTML slideshow presentations I think uh, by just in from WebDev Studios, I hope that I'm not wrong. But it's a great point that like if you're giving some uh, slideshow presentations or something. Uh, WordPress. Yeah, this one. Uh, it's, it's a great point that you can just create posts. WordPress posts. We manage all the WordPress things. So you create WordPress posts and you can bundle them in a presentation. And then, you know, you can just do this uh, presentation. Yeah, just to start with. And yeah, that's it. That's most of my slides are based on this, and it's really easy to just create rough posts, high posts, up posts, and stuff. But yeah, that's why the slides are. That, well, I can't see it from down here. It says something pops. Those dot dot slash wordpress dot 
So, yeah, I'm going to be. Do you have to hear? You need to have to hear it, it comes. <laughs> yeah, but you can ask me for the link later and I will send it here. Any else? I know that you need to process all that information, that's fine. But if you have any questions, you have like two minutes about that. Okay, thank you for your attention. I'm going to be around the whole show. Let me know if you have any questions and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.